Welcome everyone to the Arsus SDK session. I'm Hani, along with my colleague Ishan, are super excited to cover the cross-platform real-time system library we built on top of MRTC. To expose calling functionality among all family of applications here at Emeta. Ishan will cover a brief summary of Arsus, and I'll be back in a few minutes to talk about Arsus architecture. Hi everyone. I'm Ishan. I'm currently working as a software engineering manager at Meta. And I'll start with a brief introduction of Arsys. I'll talk a little bit about the origins of Arsys, what motivated this project, and how we began on this multi-year journey. In this talk, we'll briefly go over the high-level design and architecture and all of the decisions that went into building Arsys. Next, we'll go over testability, reliability, and debuggability and talk about all of the solutions that we have built in order to ensure a really high quality implementation of Arsys. And finally, we'll go over what's next for Arsys and where do we go from here as we try to scale this library to all of the various RTC use cases out there. So let's start with the most important question. What does Arsys stand for? Well, Arsys stands for real-time system an acronym that we copied from another library at Meta called MSYS, which stands for Messaging System. And also it sounded really cool, so we just went with it. Anyways, RSYS is a cross-platform video calling library built on top of WebRTC. All of this effort started way back in 2018 when we realized that the existing library that we had was built for Messenger and the code was tightly coupled to the product implementation for Messenger. However, we already had a lot of other use cases for video calling, such as Instagram and Oculus, and we realized that we needed something that was really generic, generic and scalable in order to serve all of these diverse use cases. At the same time, when we were building our sys, we were even hit by the COVID pandemic. And in that time, all of the use cases for video calling really blew out of proportion. That is when we realized that we also needed something that was really friendly and understandable to developers and something that they could quickly prototype and iterate solutions in order to ship features quickly and meet the changing environment. So on one hand, we had products such as Messenger Lite where the majority use case for calling was in really developing countries and low bandwidth and memory constraint devices. But on the other hand, we also had use cases such as Portal, where they wanted to do calling on really high-end devices and in enterprise scenarios with features such as screen sharing. So we needed something that could satisfy all of these diverse range of use cases. And that is when we decided to embark on this journey to, to build our sys and to scale it across even different operating systems such as Windows and Linux. That is why we chose to write our sys primarily in C and C++ so that it can be performant, but at the same time scale across various platforms and operating system. We choose to use WebRTC as the underlying media engine for, for our sys as it is an open source library by Google and widely used across the industry. Additionally, we even have a custom signaling protocol that we use to negotiate shared state across all of the participants in a call. Finally, the architecture of Arsys is really extensible and has a plugin model that allows developers to write features in a cross-platform way, but also enables apps to pick and choose what features they need so that they can only pay for the binary size and CPU cost of what they use. And that is what enables us to power calling on really bandwidth and memory constrained devices. So next, I'll hand it over to Hani so that we can dive deep into the architecture and understand how all of this is made possible and all of the design decisions that we needed to take throughout this journey. Thanks, Ishan. Among other talented engineers, Ishan and I have been involved in designing Arsys from the beginning. I will go over the architecture, starting with the main state loop. The core component of Arsys is a state management loop. 
Some of you might find this familiar because it is borrowed from the Redux pattern, which is heavily used in web application development. Actions are dispatched, which then drive state changes. These state changes produces side effects that drive the call experience, either externally, like driving the UI, or internally, like changing or modifying connection and media logic. Generally, the app interacts with an API that fires an action, then reducers take that action along with old state to produce new states. Finally, these new states or models are delivered to the application and internal components to drive behavior changes. For delivering cross-platform rejections, we use Genie as an IDL or interface definition language, which allows us to write the model or interface types in a language agnostic way. Here showing a snippet from the call model and call API as an example of an, of an IDL, which then generates code written in C++ or Java, which allows these applications to access SDK in their own native language. The feature is the main building block of exposing calling experiences in the application. It enables developers to write new calling experiences in RSS that can then be reused across different applications. It's a write once model and then reuse everywhere who wants it. As an example, camera or hologram logic are provided as a features and then whoever applica whatever applications want to use these capabilities, they include, the, include that in their application. It gives applications the flexibility to choose the features set they care about without worrying or paying for CPU or binary size. This enables us to support size-constrained use cases, such as messenger light and wearable hardware devices with low memory and size availability. Going deep into the feature, this is how the feature interacts with its surroundings. Features don't operate in a vacuum. They need data to run and produce new state. Some come from the other features, like participants in the call, while others come from the application, like camera frames. The feature will also expose an API that allows the application to interact with it, while on the other hand, the feature will interact with the application via proxies. The proxy implements app-specific feature behavior and lets feature have side effects, for example, asking the application to turn the camera on. Lastly, the feature emits model representing new states. So putting it all together, the main entry point into RSS is the SDK, which provides platform native interfaces, the projection we talked about in many languages. It also encapsulates a call manager along with signaling components. The signaling components, or what we refer to as SegCore, handles signaling that happens prior to starting the call. It helps us in isolating the signaling logic from the rest of our system and WebRTC libraries, it also allows us to defer loading the heavy components, which is WebRTC and the other logic, from the signaling path. Call Manager produces a call container per call, and then Call Container is a place that houses a state disp dispatcher and other features for the call. At the bottom, we have the connection, which orchestrates between media and signaling which I will cover in the next slides. And finally, media is what wraps WebRTC. So any calling applications requires signaling to communicate with an SCP server. The core of signaling is a state machine that captures the semantics of this protocol in a declarative way. This not only enables us to consolidate all this business logic for signaling in a few lines of code, but also enables us to have multiple different implementation of the protocol, as long as the underlying semantics are in fundamentally different. Hence, it's easy to evolve the protocol and also make changes to the wire format without having a rippling effect into the system. We also design signaling to be transport agnostic and the actual transport implementation is passed by the application. 
This enables products to use the most optimal implementation for their use case. Finally, all of signaling is packaged as a separate library along with RSS. This is what I, I refer to as SecCore. This creates a strong architectural separation from media-related code and also enables feature, features such as optimistic ringing, where we actually handle ringing while we load the rest of the system in the background. RSS Media implementation is a wrapper around WebRTC, the open source, from, the open source library from Google. Similar to signaling, it also uses a declarative state machine architecture to capture the semantics of WebRTC negotiations using SDBs. This not just allows us to make modifications to the WebRTC implementation itself, but also cleanly update the upstream version without needing a lot of code changes. I mentioned before we use SFU server to forward frames to multiple participants in the group call. However, in a two-person call, we forward frames in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. This becomes tricky to handle as we can add and remove people during the call, which can lead changes in the under underlying media path. However, the modular design of media and state machine architecture enables us to be agnostic of the underlying path and delegate the responsibility of path switching to the higher level component, which is in this case a connection. The connection has yet another state machine for coordinating between signaling and media. This is what, this what provides the abstraction of an ongoing call while handling both media and signaling in an embedded, as an embedded processes. Next, I will cover testing, debuggability, and reliability, and these are the most important aspects of creating a scalable library used by several different products. In RSS, we have different level of test coverage that is standard to the industry. Here we have unit testing, which is test individual components by mocking everything else. Integration test, here we only mock the server, but runs a complete system on the client, a complete scenario on the client. Also, we have end-to-end -end test that actually runs a sample application, making real calls, mimicking user inputs, and all that. It also runs as part of CI. In addition, we have stress test, which runs large calls or runs on a constraint memory devices to test for regressions. We also expose different mechanisms to aid in finding issues or helping developers write their features or integrating, into, or integrating with RSS. Things like console logs, things like actions and model logging, which logs all the action coming into the system and all the models that gets produced. These could also be used to replay what went into the call. We also have call visualizer that would that not only visualize what's happening on the server, but also on the client. The call visualization is basically derived from all different logs that all get put together. As far as day-to-day -day operations, we provide monitoring for all top-line metrics, raising alarms, if regression was detected for all applications, we have dashboards, and we also track performance, whether it's actually internally in the system or for latencies in the call. We detect, we log all crashes, and we also detect deadlock when they happen. Now I'll give it back to Ishan, who will talk of what's next for RSIS. Thanks so much, Hani, for that deep dive into the architecture of RSIS. Now that we understand how RSIS is built to be modular, scalable, and performant, Let's see where we go next from here and how we use it to scale across a variety of RTC scenarios and bring a lot of value in connecting users in the real world. So one of the major projects that we have been working on is end-to-end -end encryption. And thanks to the modular design of Arces, we are able to build this feature in a way such that only apps that need this feature are able to use it. Also, End-to-end -end encryption requires fundamental changes to not just the signaling protocol, but also how media flows within RSIS. And because we have invested in developer efficiency, developers are able to 
visualize the entire system and build this feature in a modular way so that it doesn't require a lot of years to build this feature and doesn't become a rippling effect across the entire code base. Instead, we are able to make quick progress on it and also investing in unit and integration testing, we are able to ship this feature with confidence. RSYS is also used in a lot of Oculus devices. And let me give you a fun fact. Actually, the very first partner that onboarded onto RSYS was Workrooms. That is when we realized that having a really stable piece of infrastructure that allows you to quickly prototype and build solutions is crucial to powering the metaverse and scaling to RTC use cases that go beyond traditional video calling. We have features such as avatar calling and spatial audio that require us to send massive amounts of arbitrary data that is different from traditional audio and video data that is sent in video calling. And the modular design of RSYS and the stable infrastructure enables metaverse applications to quickly prototype and understand what works and what doesn't work. And that is how we are able to push the boundaries of what is possible through calling. Now we are also invested heavily in reliability of RSYS because we power millions of calls every day. And that requires us to make sure that all of our core calling scenarios work in the variety of use cases out there across millions of devices and all of the different markets that exist on low bandwidth, high bandwidth, memory constraint, CPU constraint, and, and so on. This is where all of the investment in integration testing provides us a lot of value, but we aren't stopping there. We are trying to enable scenarios that include upwards of 50 participants in a call that not just requires us to go in and optimize really small portions of code within like various areas in RSYS. It also requires a deep understanding of the entire system in order to find optimizations across the st stack. Finally, we are exploring ways to, to scale our library to use cases beyond traditional video calling such as using WebAssembly to use RSYS in browser applications. This opens up a whole new set of scenarios and use cases for us so that we can power even web applications. So the future is really, really exciting for us. And I am super excited that I got an opportunity to be an, a, a part of this journey and also to have this opportunity to share this journey with all of you today. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. And thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about RSYS today.